The Lord be with you. Thank you and welcome to worship this morning. We are lifting up uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday today and in honor of his birthday, Professor Harry Waters Jr. is here. Uh, he will be reading um, an excerpted portion from one of the Reverend Dr. King's sermons. And uh, he spent some time, the professor spent some time with us in between worship services teaching us from, a, from Dr. King's book called Strength to Love from a section called Love in Action. It was wonderful, it was really powerful, and we hope that you're fed today by the, Dr. King's words from the pulpit. Dr. King preached here in 1962 in Holy Week from that pulpit, and so it's a real honor to be able to just get a hint of that today as we celebrate. There's a lunch and learn after worship today, so you're welcome to grab Sunday lunch downstairs in the fellowship hall and join us across the way in the Anna Paulson room. And it's a budget presentation, and it's gonna be a good one. So I'll be there, Matt Michael Gentis will be there, Bill Crossan will be there, and we hope to see you there. That Lunch and Learn is in preparation for then our congregational meeting next week. And so for those of you who like to dig a little deeper into understanding where your gifts of money go for the ministry of this congregation, that's a really good time for you to dig deep this afternoon. And now I invite you to stand and greet one another as we begin. I invite you to remain standing as we speak a word of confession and hear a word of God's good forgiveness in response. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us, that we may bathe in the glory of your Son born among us and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ and inheritors of eternal life. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also Let us pray. O oh God, you direct our lives by your grace, and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve each other, our community and the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from 1 Samuel. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose sight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am, and ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call you. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. Then the Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Go, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again, a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. The word of the Lord.
a reading from Romans. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his 12 disciples, those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Welcome whoever you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Now when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and proclaim his message in their cities. The Gospel of the Lord. Pastor Gail went to get a microphone that we thought we would have handy, but we forgot to let the sound guys know we would need to use it two times. So this is my friend, Professor Harry Waters Jr. His parents are here today, over there, just like many of your parents are here today. He's a friend of the congregation, and he's a professor, a college professor. And just like your teachers in school, he taught older students um, all kinds of things, and I'm going to let him talk about that because, et voila, a microphone. Okay. Okay, are we on? We're on. Oh, my goodness. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, you all can say good morning. <laughs> good morning, you all. Good morning. Yay, they did that. Okay, this is going to be really, really simple because it's even called a children's sermon. What I'm interested in is who you are and what your favorite color is. So I want you to tell me your name and your favorite color, and you can use the microphone and put it close to your mouth. What's your name? My name is Cora, and my favorite color is pink. Mm -hmm. My favorite, my name is Lauren, and my favorite color is purple and pink. Mm -hmm. My favorite color is red. Yes. My name is Lillian, and my favorite color is yellow. My name is Jasper, and my favorite color is blue. My name is Alex, and my favorite color is also oh blue. My name is Ben, and my favorite color is also blue. <laughs> my name is Owen, and my favorite color is red. My name is Iris, and my favorite color is blue. And my name is Harry Waters Jr. And my favorite color is maroon. 
So everybody has a favorite color, right? But you know what it means? That it also means that everybody got to hear and share what everybody's color was. So now you all actually know more about each other. And so you get to be a community. And you get to be a place where you get to be, and this is going to be for all of you later, you get to be human with each other, you know? Because if you ask the bird what his favorite color is, I don't know if you're going to understand what they say, but if you ask your dog or your pet what's their favorite color, it's hard to say. But with us, being all humans together, no matter how different we are, no matter what color we are, or no matter how tall we are, <laughs> or how small we are, we're all getting to be human together, but we all get to be different. And that being different is such an important thing for us to go like, oh, okay, I'm really different. I'm gonna ask them one more quick question. What's your favorite dessert? My favorite dessert is chocolate cake with a lot of frosting. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what my favorite dessert is. Mine is marshmallows covered in chocolate. Yes. Mine is a tie between ice cream, donuts, and banana chocolate cake with maple frosting. <laughs> I don't know which, which one is mine. Mine, mine is chocolate chip with a cherry on the top of a marshmallow. <laughs> mine is whoopie pie. <laughs> mine is icebox cake. Mine is my grandmother's chocolate cake without frosting. I have two. One is my mother used to make peach cobbler. That was absolutely the most amazing thing in the world. And my other favorite dessert is key lime pie. So we all have things that make us really happy, but we all can be different. Or you cannot know which one is going to be the only one, and you can have all of them until you decide. But what we got to do was we heard everybody's voice. And everybody's voice is important. And everybody's voice has a little bit of difference to it. And what we do is we say, yeah, OK? So I want you all together to say with me, yeah! Ready? One, two, three. Yeah! <laughs> and one more, to th I want you to say, this is great. One, two, three. Yeah. This is great! great. <laughs> and that's what I want to thank you all for, because you're going to be teaching all of these people here how to be together but still be different. It's amazing. You're getting to share it because your bodies, your voices, your spirits are the ones that we are in envy of because you're still being totally honest with who you are. And that's the love that you're getting to share, believe it or not, with all these people here. So I want to thank you for sharing your love with me and with each other. Okay, can we close in prayer? Yes. All right. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for this professor. Thank you for this professor. Thank you for our minds. Thank you for our minds. Our bodies. Our bodies. Our ideas. Our ideas. And especially our love. And especially our love. We love you, God. We love you, God. Thank you for loving us first. Thank you for loving us first. Amen. 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 All right, you guys can go back to your seats. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, that was so cool. Come on, you gotta admit. Yes, <laughs> right? That you get to have these little spirits, these little loves share who they are with you and with each other. And that's kind of 
like what we're here to talk about today, um, the sermon that Martin Luther King has, and he's had many on many topics. In 1957, this particular sermon was offered that addressed several issues, including identity and healthy human mental conditions. This morning, our subject is conquering self-centeredness. So we do turn to the New Testament for our text this morning, a very familiar passage we have heard. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew 10, 39. Now, an individual has not begun to live until he can rise above the narrow horizons of his particular individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. Martin loved a long phrase, didn't he? And this is one of the big problems of life, so that many people never quite get to the point of rising above self, so that they end up the tragic victims of self-centeredness. Life has its beginnings and its maturity comes into being when an individual rises above self to something greater. Few individuals learn this and they go through life merely existing and never living victims of self-centeredness. They are the people who live in eternal I. <laughs> they do not have the capacity to project the I into the thou. They live a life of perpetual egotism. They start out the minute you talk to them, talking about what they can do, what they've done. They're the people that will tell you before you talk to them five minutes, where they've been, who they know, where they went to school, how much money they have. And we meet these people every day we meet it in ourselves, and we meet it in other selves, this problem of self-centeredness. Now, we can say to a certain extent that persons in this situation are persons who have never really grown up. They're still children. For you see, a child is inevitably, necessarily egocentric, a bundle of sensations clamoring for to be cared for. And their social context, they belong to their mother, but they care for their mother only because they want to be fed and protected. They don't care for their mother for her own sake, but they care for her mother for their own sake. So a child is inevitably egocentric, inevitably self-centered. This is why Dr. Burnham says that during the first six or seven years of development, the ego is dominant within the child. Now, when one matures, one rises above the early years of childhood. He begins to love people for their own sake. He turns himself to higher loyalties. He gives himself to something outside of himself. He gives himself to causes that he lives for and sometimes will die for. He comes to the point that now he can rise above his individualistic concerns and understands that what Jesus meant when he said, he who finds his life shall lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake shall find it. In other words, he who finds his ego shall lose his ego, but he who loseth his ego for my sake shall find it. And so, you see, People are apparently selfish. It isn't merely an ethical issue, but it's also a psychological issue. They are the victims of arrested development, and they are still children. They haven't grown up. And like a modern novelist says about one of his characters, Edith is a little country bounded on the east and the west, on the north and the south by Edith. And so many people are like little countries, bounded all around by themselves, and they never quite get out of themselves. And these are the persons that are victimized with arrested development. Now, the consequences of disruptive and the disruptive effects of self-centeredness, such egocentric desires, can be tragic. At first, it leads to, well, frustration, disillusionment, unhappiness at many points. For usually when people are self-centered, they are self-centered because they're seeking attention. They want to be admired, and this is the way they set out to do it. But in the process, because of their self-centeredness, they are not admired. They are mawkish, and, they don't want, and people don't want to be bothered with them. And so the very thing they seek, they never get. And they end up frustrated, unhappy, disillusioned. Also, it can lead to extreme sensitiveness. 
The individual who is self-centered, the individual who is egocentric, ends up being very sensitive, a very touchy person. And that is one of the tragic effects of a self-centered attitude. It leads to a very sensitive and touchy response to the universe. And they are sensitive because they're self-centered. And they are too absorbed in the self, and anything sets them off, and anything makes them angry. Oh, that even leads to the point that the individual is not capable of facing trouble and hard moments of life. Now, one can become so self-centered, so egocentric, that when the hard and difficult moments of life come, they cannot face them because they're too self-centered in themselves. These are the people who cannot face disappointments. These are the people who cannot face being defeated. These are the people who cannot face being criticized. These are the people who cannot face these many experiences of life which inevitably come because they are too centered in themselves. In time, somebody criticizes them. In time, somebody says something about them that they don't like. Sometimes they are disappointed. Times they are defeated. They end up brokenhearted. They can't stand up under it because they're too centered in self. And finally, it can become so morbid that it rises to ominous proportions and leads to a tragic sense of persecution. There are persons who come to a point that they are so self-centered that they end up with a persecution complex, and the end result is insanity. They end up thinking that the universe stands against them, that everybody is against them. They are little solar systems within themselves, and they can't see beyond that. And as a result of their failure to get out of self, they end up with a persecution complex and sometimes madness and insanity. All right, so now we're going to raise the question, how then do we conquer self-centeredness? How do we get away from this thing? How can we live in this universe with a balance and with the type of perspective that keeps us going smoothly and we're not too absorbed in self? How do we do it? We think one of the ways to face this problem of self-centeredness is to discover some cause and some purpose, some loyalty outside of yourself and give yourself to that something. Best way to handle it is to not suppress the ego, but to extend the ego objectively in meaningful channels. Because so many people are unhappy because they aren't doing anything. They're self-centered because they aren't doing anything. They haven't given themselves to anything, and they just move around their little circles. So one of the ways to um, rise above this self-centeredness is to move away from self and find some great cause and some great purpose, some loyalty to which you can give yourself and then become so absorbed in that something that you give your life to it. Men and women have done this throughout all of the generations, and they have found that necessary ego satisfaction that life presents and that one desires through projecting self into something outside of self. Now, you don't try to solve the problem by trampling on the ego altogether, for you will always have an ego, and the ego has certain desires, certain desires for significance like dessert and different colors. Now, the three great psychoanalysts of this age, of this century, pointed out that there are certain basic desires that human beings have and that they long for and that they seek at any cost. For Freud, the basic desire was to be loved. Um, Jung would say that the basic desire is to be secure. But then comes Adler, who comes along and says, the basic desire of human nature is to feel important and a sense of significance. Now, certainly, all of those are significant, but the one that Adler mentions is probably a little bit more because all human beings have a desire to belong and to feel significant and important. Now, the way to solve this problem is not to drown out the ego, but to find your sense of importance in something outside yourself. And you are able to live because you have given your life to something outside and something that is meaningful, objectified. 
You rise above self-absorption to something outside. And then you can find, even find Jesus totally objectifying himself when he cries out, ye have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. This is the way to go through life in a balance with the proper perspective that you've given yourself to something greater than self, something that sometimes is friends, sometimes it's family, sometimes it's a great cause, a great loyalty, but give yourself to that something and life becomes meaningful. I've seen people who discovered a great deal of meaning in their love, in their jobs, and they become so absorbed in it that they didn't have time to become self, self-centered. They loved their job. And the great prayer that anyone could pray at that point is, Oh, God, help me to love my job as this individual loves his or hers. God, help me to give myself to my work and to my job and to my allegiance as this individual does. And this is a way out. Now, another way out to rise above self-centeredness, and that is by having the proper inner attitude toward your position or toward your status in life, whatever it is. You conquer self-centeredness by coming to the point of seeing that you are where you are today because somebody helped you get there. Somebody helped you get there. Mm. And so many people you see live self-centered, egocentric lives because they have the attitude that they are responsible for everything and for their position in life. Everything they do in life, they feel somehow that they are responsible and solely responsible for it. The individual gets away from this type of self-centeredness when he pauses enough to see that no matter what he does in life, he does that because somebody helped him do it. He comes to see that somebody stands in the background, often doing a little job in a big way, making it possible for him to do what he's doing. That no matter where you stand, no matter how much popularity you have, no matter how much education you have, no matter how much money you have, you have it because somebody in this universe helped you to get it. And when you see that, you really can't be arrogant. You can't be supercilious. You discover that you have your position because of the events of history and because of individuals in the background making it possible for you to stand there. Now, I will say one of the prayers that Martin Luther King would share here is, oh, God, help me to see myself in my true perspective. Help me to see, oh, God, that I'm just a symbol of a movement. Help me to see that I'm the victim of what the Germans call zeitgeist and that something was getting ready to happen in history. History was ready for it and that a boycott would have taken place in Montgomery, Alabama, if I had never come to Alabama. Oh, God, help me to see that where I stand today, I stand because others helped me to stand there and because the forces of history projected me there. And this moment would have come in history even if Martin Luther King had never been born. This is the prayer I pray to God every day. Lord, help me to see Martin Luther King in his true perspective. Because if I don't see that, I will become the biggest fool in America. <laughs> now, I think that's why Jesus looked at a man one day and called him a fool, because the man was standing around talking about his barns, and he said, I'm going to tear down my barns and build greater barns, and I'm just going to say to my soul, eat, drink, and be merry. And Jesus looked at that man and said, you're a fool, because he didn't have sense enough to realize that where he stood was in, term, in terms of his barns and his wealth was because somebody in the background helped him to get there. We never get anywhere in this world without the forces of history and individual persons in the background helping us to get there. Marian Anderson discovered that she stands today in the position of fame and of prestige because somebody in the background helped her to get there. And only by seeing this can we rise out. If you have the privilege of a fine education, well, you have it because somebody made it possible. If you have the privilege to gain wealth and a bit of the world's goods, well, you have it because somebody made it possible. Now don't boast. Don't be arrogant. You, at that moment, rise out of your self-centeredness to the type of living 
that makes you an integrated personality. Finally, the proper religious faith gives us this type of balance and this type of perspective that I'm talking about. This, you see, is something of the genius of great religion, that on one hand, it gives a man a sense of belonging. And on the other hand, it gives him a sense of dependence on something higher. He realizes that there is something beyond which he lives and moves and even moves and gains his being. This is what great religion does for him. This is what religion at its best does. It keeps you to the point that you, you don't feel that you're too low and you don't feel that you're too high, but you maintain a type of balance. And you come to see that you're an adjective, not a noun. It's only God that is a noun and you are a dependent clause not an independent clause. <laughs> you come to see that through religion somehow there is only one being in this universe that can say, I am, unconditionally. We turn over to Genesis and we read of God saying, I am that I am. And that's the only being that can say that because man is a child of God and he must always say, I am because of. And when you come to see that, you see that your existence is adjectival. <laughs> it is dependent on something else. Your existence is dependent on the existence of a higher power, and you can't walk around the universe with arrogance. You can't walk around the universe with a haughty spirit because you know that there is a God in this universe that you're dependent on. Now, we are not at the center of this universe. We are only at the center to the extent that we give ourselves and our allegiance to God Almighty. And I'm so glad that the new science has come into being to dampen our arrogance. It says to us that our earthly planet is a dependent planet. And that does something to each of us so that we can see when we have faith in God, that we have nothing to boast about, we have nothing to be arrogant about, but we live with humility and that keeps us going. And when you take this attitude, you go into the room of your life and you take down the mirrors because you can no longer see yourself, but the mirrors somehow are transformed into windows and you look out into the objective world and you see that what you are and who you are is because of somebody else. You are what you are because of the grace of the Almighty God. He who seeks to find his ego will lose it, but he who loses his ego in some great cause, some great purpose, some great ideal, some great loyalty, he who discovers somehow that he stands where he stands because of the forces of history and because of the other individuals, he who discovers that he stands where he stands because of the grace of God, finds himself. He loses himself in that something, but later finds himself. And this is the way it seems to me to the integrated personality. Oh God, our gracious Father, help us rise out of our attitude of self-centeredness, out of our egotism. Help us rise to the point of having faith in Thee, realizing that we are dependent on Thee. And when we realize this, oh God, we will live life with a new meaning and with a new understanding and with a new integration. We ask thee, God, to grant all these blessings in the name and spirit of Jesus. Amen.
in the words of the psalmist, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come in his presence with thanksgiving. Let's make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is great. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. God of grace. Heavenly Father, we rejoice and give you thanks for the power on display throughout time and place, calling all kinds of people to be witnesses of your grace and power. Guide us, your people, into welcoming your prophets and teachers amongst us and hearing God's good news through them. Thank you for the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the service of all who work for civil rights. God of grace. We ask echoing in the words of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., O oh God, make us willing to do your will, come what may. Increase the number of persons of goodwill and moral sensitivity. Give us renewed confidence in nonviolence and the way of love taught by Christ. God of grace. We pray for all who long for healing of mind, body, or spirit. Lord, you are able to bring hope even through the toughest times, strengthening us for your purpose. We especially pray for Ashley, Jerry, Arlen, Sandy, Wes, Diane, Lori, Ron, Marsha, Jacqueline, Edward, Joe, Quentin, Mark, Perry High School in Iowa and their community, and those whom we name in our hearts. God of grace, we pray for all who mourn their loved ones, their dreams, and other losses that we may or may not understand. Help them find comfort in your unending love and support through those who are instruments of your love. We pray for the friends and family of Dolly Lager, Don Trafficanti, Janelle Spercados, and those whom we name in our hearts. God of grace. We rejoice in the baptism of Jackson Jordan and his parents, Kathy and Justin, and his many grandparents. May he grow in faith as he is surrounded by love and prayer. God of grace. We, leave the, we lift these prayers and the prayers known only to you, O gracious God, confident in the promise of your saving love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please take a moment to share a sign of Christ's peace with those around you.
O God, sovereign of the universe, you offer us new beginnings and guide us on our journey. Lead us to your table, nourish us with this heavenly food, and prepare us to carry your love to a hungry world. In the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. A word of instruction. The ushers will bring you forward and there'll be two lines and you'll go this way and then back around. The bread you receive is all gluten-free. There's in cups and small cups are grape juice, which is lighter colored, or wine, which is the darker colored. If you would prefer to receive a blessing, please cross your arms and we are glad to pray with you during this time. For those who are worshiping with us on live stream, you may use bread or crackers, wine, grape juice from your home and know that you're joining with us in the sacrament. If you need to receive it in your, where you're sitting, just let the usher know and we're glad to bring it to you at that time. The most important thing to know is this is not my table. This is not the table of Augustana Lutheran Church or even of the ELCA. This is the Lord's table and all are invited. All are welcome. So come and receive this gift of grace. Amen.
I invite you to stand. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace from today to life everlasting. Amen. Amen. And let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all. Strengthen with the richness of your grace in your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. God, who leaves you in the pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you, and who calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in today and forever. Amen.
in peace and hope. Yes.